In this video, I'm going to talk to you about some of the challenges we face when we work with health data. And a good place to start this discussion is to talk about primary versus secondary use of health data. So primary use of health data is when we use data for the same reason why we collected it. And I'll give you two examples of this. Let's say that we're collecting data for the purposes of delivering patient care, like a patient comes to see me in clinic, I write down you know, how the patient is doing, what I found on their physical exam, what their lab results showed, and you know, what actions we decided to take as a result of that visit. All that stuff is going to be documented in a clinical note, which is meant to be a way of communicating to other physicians and other care providers uh, you know, what the decision making was when I saw that patient. It's also meant to be a mechanism for me to remind myself you know, why I did what I did or why we discussed what we discussed uh, when I see that patient next time in clinic. And also more and more, it's a way to communicate uh, some of the patient's care plan back with them because they'll have access to this note uh, through their patient portal as they try to you know, see what we discussed at that visit. Another example of primary use of data is if we were conducting a clinical study or a clinical trial, we might be collecting data for the purposes of trying to answer a specific research question uh, and then when we go to analyze that data, we would be analyzing it to answer that research question. And so what both of those examples have in common is that all the considerations that go into how we collect that data and what data we collect is driven by the reason why we were collecting that data in the first place. Secondary use of data is when we collect data uh, for one reason and then we analyze it for a different reason. So a common example of this is if we're trying to measure the quality of care that we're delivering. Uh, so you know, are we starting a patient on a certain type of medication uh, after they've had a stroke or a heart attack? Uh, the reason we're collecting that data uh, or the way in which we're collecting that data uh, was likely driven by clinical care decisions. So how I charted you know, whether a patient received uh, a specific medication had to do with you know, the primary reason of uh, delivering care when that charting took place. However, when we try to go back and you know, retrospectively look at that data, meaning we look at that data after the fact, we're trying to answer a specific question about the quality of care that we're delivering. And so when we're looking at you know, data for, from that purpose, we might be faced with data that's imperfect because the thought process that went into how the data was collected was driven by the patient care you know, uh, initiative and not the uh, reasoning uh, that has to do with after the fact measurement. And this is a consideration that happens for a lot of research that happens on kind of observational or retrospective data. Oftentimes there are considerations that uh, you would have taken if you knew you wanted to collect the data for research that didn't get taken into account because that data was already collected for a different reason. And so often we're, we're left with kind of making some analytical decisions to try to deal with those imperfections. So what are some examples of primary use of data in healthcare? I highlighted kind of two common ones. One is conducting research uh, and collecting data for the purposes of driving that research. And a second one would be conducting clinical care and collecting data for the purposes of uh, conducting clinical care when the reason the data is collected and the reason the data is being used are aligned, we call that primary use. We talked about one common reason for uh, you know, secondary use of data, but there are really several variations on that theme where you are given a data set and anytime you're given a data set, there's an implication that the data has already been collected and it was probably collected using, you know, at least some decisions that, you know, you would have done differently had you had kind of primary control of the data collection mechanism. And so some of the problems with secondary use of data are that when you're analyzing data for a different reason than why it was collected, there are going to be biases in that uh, data or there are going to be issues with the sampling or the way in which that data was collected that will manifest themselves when you go to analyze it uh, that will kind of may not be obvious at first but uh, that you will find in the course of your analysis. So 
If this is your first class kind of working with health data or thinking about health data, you might be wondering, are we allowed to use health data secondarily? Aren't there privacy laws that prevent patient information from being shared? Uh, you've certainly heard of, uh, or if you haven't, you may have heard of uh, recent news articles showing how you know, uh, Google had a deal with a local uh, uh, health chain, actually a national health chain that has a local branch called Ascension Health, where they were processing a series of patient notes kind of without many of the doctors knowing and without many of the patients knowing. So how is that legal is a question that may come up because what happened in that case was, you know, is very likely going to turn out to have been legal. You may have also heard of this uh, phrase or term HIPAA, uh, which stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. And you might be wondering, how does HIPAA play into this? Because we know HIPAA has something to do with privacy. So let's talk about that in a little, little bit more detail. So first of all, it's important to know that HIPAA is spelled with two A's and not with two P's. Um, so when you're writing HIPAA in any of your write-ups for this class, I want to see it spelled correctly. Um, you know, and the other thing you might notice is that the word privacy is nowhere in uh, the you know acronym for HIPAA, because uh, HIPAA is actually a law that was passed uh, to make it easier for patients to transport their health insurance when they move between employers with the concern being that you know, people might lose their health coverage as they switch between employers. And embedded within that law was uh, you know, some uh, rules that were implemented to uh, protect patients' privacy. So HIPAA is actually not mainly about privacy, it's mainly about portabil portability of health insurance, but it's also the primary place where a lot of the you know, uh, considerations come up uh, that have to do with regulating uh, the privacy of health data. So the first thing to know about HIPAA is that HIPAA applies only to covered entities. So health plans, billing services, um, healthcare providers, anyone who transmits health data back and forth uh, for the purposes of you know, uh, operating a healthcare business or delivering healthcare are covered by uh, the HIPAA legislation. The other thing to know is that HIPAA has five sections that are known as titles. Now, as I mentioned previously, Title I, which is kind of the first part of the law, is really designed to protect health insurance coverage for, for workers and their families when they change or lose their jobs. However, uh, Section 2, or Title II of HIPAA, uh, is focused on establishing national standards for electronic healthcare transactions and uh, national identifiers for providers health insurance plans and employers. And so this is the uh, part of HIPAA that has to do with you know, protecting uh, privacy and security of health information. So does this apply to companies like Google uh, or companies like app developers that you know, kind of deal casually in fitness information? Well, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't kind of vouch for the exact uh, nature of the way that HIPAA has been in interpreted by case law. But I will say that generally, if a, you know, a startup company is asking you for health information and you provide it your health information in an app, that generally I don't think would be covered by HIPAA because that startup company, which kind of uh, isn't necessarily maybe a company that deals primarily in health, may not be considered a covered entity. So just a reminder that you know this rulemaking only applies to covered entities like health systems uh, and insurance companies. So two of the five rules that are part of Title II are particularly relevant to our class. The first one is the HIPAA privacy rule. This is the rule that defines what is considered protected health information and who may have access to that information. This applies to electronic, written, and oral communication. And so pretty much any way in which that protected health information is shared is governed by um, the HIPAA privacy rule. And specifically, what is that information that we can and can't share uh, you know, between a healthcare provider and an insurance company, or a healthcare provider and someone else. Then there's the HIPAA security rule, which lays out administrative, physical, and technical standards 
that dictate how electronic PHI is to be kept secure. So the fact that you know your data must be encrypted, that it has to have certain safeguards in how it is stored um, is something that doesn't have anything to do with the privacy per se, but has to do with the security. Um, so realize that the notion of privacy is you know, uh, something that we can violate when we share something we shouldn't have shared. And the notion of security is how we store that information to protect it, regardless of whether that information itself is private or not. So according to this legislation, uh, these are the 18 elements that constitute protected health information. Some of these are pretty obvious and others may not be initially obvious uh, as you kind of look through them. And so I'll draw your attention to a few of these. So obviously your name is considered PHI, but you may not have considered that your zip code is also considered PHI. So if you're going to share a zip code, you're allowed to share the first three digits of a zip code if the population within those first three digits is larger than 20,000 people. Uh, interestingly, uh, any dates related to a patient uh, other that are more specific than a year are considered PHI. So if I share with you that I, you know, discharged a patient yesterday from the hospital, I technically have shared PHI with you. Uh, and so any data, you know, any dates that you'll find in publicly available data sets are typically going to be shifted by some arbitrary amount uh, so that you don't know exactly when those dates were. So realize even if there's no name in the data set, if I just say this was the patient's date of admission, date of death, date of discharge, date of birth, any date, that is considered protected health information in and of itself. Another interesting thing I'll bring to your attention is that any ages over the age of 89 are considered PHI. So if I told you that I took care of a 91-year-old patient, uh, or if I, you know, uh, uh, in my data set included an age above the age of 89, that would be a violation of uh, HIPAA because that would in constitute protected health information if I shared it with the public. So I could share it with the patient, I can share it with an insurance company, um, but I cannot share it with the general public. And so you are allowed to share information for the purposes of delivering patient care. Um, I don't want you to assume that you can't. You can share information with vendors uh, as part of an operational goal. So if you need to you know, bill an insurance company as part of your operating you know, your business as a hospital, you're allowed to do that. But uh, performing research with health data or really any other activity that falls outside of healthcare operations and kind of providing healthcare is something that uh, uh, you are not allowed to do uh, under uh, HIPAA without special kind of permissions or without special review. Now, one thing you could do is you could remove the 18 identifiers and if you got a hold of a data set where those 18 identifiers were said to be kind of completely removed, then that data set actually could be shared publicly because it's de-identified. Um, and de-identified in health data has a very specific meaning, which means all 18 of those identifiers were removed. And even if they're removed, you might want an expert to take a look at it to make sure that there's no other way to kind of recreate uh, who individual patients in your data set might be. If you have a data set that contains only, um, you know, some dates, uh, some more specific uh, location elements like city, state, uh, or zip code, or age that's more specific than just years, like years plus months, for example, that data set is called a limited data set. And a limited data set contains some PHI, but kind of these only these limited elements of uh, PHI, and that's why it's called a limited data set. This data set can't be shared kind of just publicly, generally, but there are situations in which this can be shared via a data use agreement. Um, and so even if a data set is de-identified, certain times uh, owners of that data set will share it as a limited data set on the off chance that there may have been one of these elements that got kind of left into the data set. 
Uh, but just recognize that de-identified data is you know, able to be publicly shared. Limited data set requires a data use agreement. So any data set that we work with in this class that's publicly available, you must assume that it would have been de-identified or that it's not real data. So that's the first question you want to ask when you come across a data set that contains things like dates is, are the dates real? Is the data set real? And, you know, and if not, uh, how is this data available publicly? Because it shouldn't be. So obviously, if you're doing research, you know, you're going to uh, at times need access to identify data. Um, you may need access to specific ages. You might need access to specific dates. It's very rare that you can get away, you know, and answer a meaningful research question without, at the very minimum, having access to some data information. And so, if you are at Michigan Medicine, um, there is a process to get access to identified data. The first thing you need to do is to get uh, IRB approval. IRB stands for Institutional Review Board. This is a review board that uh, is designed to protect the re interests of research participants. In this application, you have to justify why you need access to PHI. You've got to explain how you're going to minimize risk to patients, meaning how are you going to kind of only collect what you need, securely receive, store, and analyze data to try to minimize a breach of confidentiality, which is what would happen if uh, your security mechanisms were breached. Uh, you need to specify, you know, where what infrastructure you're going to use to do the data analysis. And University of Michigan has several university approved, uh, you know, ways of analyzing and storing data uh, that contains protected health information. And there's actually a mechanism to go out and query and request that data using a self-service tool known as DataDirect. Uh, and so you have to apply and get access to DataDirect, but there is a mechanism to get access to data for the purposes of analysis, uh, if you are a researcher at the University of Michigan or you know affiliated with uh, Michigan Medicine. But at every place that has access to health data, they'll have their own process. It'll generally be very similar to what I've outlined here for Michigan Medicine. So what I want you to kind of take away from this is that primary and secondary use of data uh, have very different problems to deal with when you're doing analysis. Secondary use of data is the more common situation for retrospective data analysis, but you know, the data might have been collected for a reason other than why uh, you want to use it. There are laws that protect uh, and identify which information about patients need to be protected, but there are kind of ethical ways of using that data for the purposes of research, typically uh, through uh, submission and approval of a application to an institutional review board. Okay, thanks so much.